If you were here last week, you might be wondering right now, did he iron the bottom half of his shirt today? <laughs> you might be wondering that. Uh, and, and if you don't get that, then what you should probably do is you should probably go in our app right now or um, go online and, and go watch the message from last week. By the way, you can do that. You can send it to people. You can share it with people who haven't been here for church. Maybe that's a good way to invite a friend to start coming to church, to ease them in. You go and just send them the link to our site where they can watch the messages and they can see what's going on and, and, and get acclimated that way. I'm realizing as I'm rolling up my sleeves, I didn't need to iron them either, but oh well. But that's not the problem I want to talk to you about today. There's another problem I have among the many problems I have that I want to talk with you about today, and it's this. It's, there's one problem that I, I've had my whole life, and it's that I like to be self-sufficient, or at least think that I'm self-sufficient. I want to know how everything works. I want to be able to handle anything so that if it goes wrong, I know how to fix it. I know how to make it happen. I can take care of it. I've been this way my whole life. In school, I never wanted to ask the teachers for help. I wanted to figure it out myself. I had two older brothers, didn't want to ask those knuckleheads anything, even though they were smart. I just wanted to figure it out for myself. I failed my first semester of trigonometry in 10th grade. I failed it. Don't tell my mom. She's a, she has a master's in mathematics. I failed it, not because I was too stupid to understand trig, but because I was too stupid to go and ask for help. I wanted to figure out sine, cosine, tangent, and all that nonsense. Not nonsense, kids, it's really good to learn. Um, I wanted to figure it out for myself, and I didn't, and I couldn't, and I didn't even go to my mom, who has a master's in mathematics, to ask it, and so I, I failed that first semester of trigonometry. I want to be able to kind of bear grills my life. And think that no matter what, what situation I end up in, I can get dropped into it and I can work my way out, I can figure my way out, I can, I can make it happen. And in spite of multiple times in my life where this way of trying to be self-sufficient has failed and gotten me into bad spots, it's still hard for me to let go and completely trust other people and rely on them to do things. I want to know for myself how it works and how it happens. And I have to deliberately choose and work hard to not be self-sufficient and to not know. And, and sometimes that's a blissful moment to say, you know, I don't know how that works. But it's not easy to do that. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure some of you, really, all of us, are that way, we want to be self-sufficient or we want to at least believe we're self-sufficient. It's kind of part of the American motto, this self-sufficiency. It's what we believe uh, ought to be the case. It's what we've grown up with. You might say it's in the water here. There's a certain pride in being or feeling self-sufficient. It strokes our ego and makes us feel Oh, better than those people who have to ask for help with their computer. <laughs> I can fix my own computer, that kind of stuff. That's where we feel superior and our ego gets stroked. But being self-sufficient is a problem. Do you know why it's a problem? Because we're not self-sufficient. Not a single one of us is self-sufficient. We weren't created to be that way. Self-sufficiency is an illusion, a trap, really, for people who were created by God for community. Community with God and with each other. Self-sufficiency is an obstacle to God's blessing in your life. And that's what we're talking about through this series about Jacob. We're talking about God's blessing. So let me show you through Jacob's life. Jacob is our ongoing example here. Last week when we left Jacob, let me just remind you where we were. He took his family and he was running away from his uncle who had been mistreating them for about 20 years, taking advantage of him. And they were running away. His uncle was going to kill him, but God intervened. And, and he's heading back home to where he grew up, to where his grandfather Abraham and Isaac, his father, were. He's heading back home because God told him to go home, which sounds nice. That sounds like that would be a wonderful thing after 20 years away from home to be able to go back home. Except, remember what happened and why he left home? His brother Esau had vowed to kill him, to murder him for the things that he had done to Esau and to their father Isaac, how he had manipulated and cheated and lied and done all these things to get 
the inheritance and everything for himself. And so he doesn't really know what's waiting for him at home, except Esau and that threat. And so that's where we pick up his story and begin to learn that self-sufficiency does not make you secure. So Genesis chapter 32, again, you can follow along in our app. If you've got our app on your phone, you can take notes there. The scriptures are going to be there for this first part. I'm not going to put them on the screen because it's a lot. But go to your Bible as well. If you have your Bible with you, it's always a good thing to bring your Bible. Uh, Open it up and go to chapter 32 of Genesis. And that's where we're going to take up Jacob's story. They're on their way home. Let me show you the map. Just put that up real quick. I know you can't really see this from where you're sitting. Those of you watching from home, one, we miss you. Come back. Be here. I know it's easier in your pajamas, but come on. And those of you who are recovering, I get it. We can't wait to see you back. But um, on this map, you can see the circle. So at the top is a blue circle. That's where Jacob is coming from. At the bottom is a red circle. That's where Esau currently lives. In the middle is a green circle. That's where our story is going to take place today. They're going to be meeting right in that middle spot. And then to the left, that kind of goldish circle is the promised land. It's the land God promised to Abraham. It's the land that Jacob is going back to because that's the place where God wants to bless the world through him. So on his way back, so we're entering that green circle, he comes to this place called Mahanaim, and there he encounters the angels of God, and he says, okay, God is here. God is here, and it's an indication that he's getting closer to this land that God has set apart for his purposes, that these angels are there guarding it. And Jacob sends messengers ahead because he knows Esau is coming. And so he sends them down to his brother Esau in in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom, and he tells them, here's what I want you to say to my brother. He says, go to him and say, your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban And have remained there until now. I have cattle, I have donkeys and sheep and goats, and I have male and female servants working for me. Now I'm sending you this message, my Lord, that I may find favor in your eyes. Why do you think Jacob would want to send a message like that to his brother Esau? It's been 20 years. I'm coming back home to this land, the inheritance that rightfully is mine because I procured it from you. But he says, I'm coming back and I've got all kinds of cattle and sheep and people in my employ. He's trying to say, look, I'm not coming back to take anything from you. I have what I need, all right? Please don't, don't, we don't have to fight. That's what he's trying to like buffer this. So he sends him with that message. Great. Verse six, when the messengers returned to Jacob after talking to his brother Esau, they said, we went to your brother Esau and now he's coming to meet you. Oh, okay. With 400 men. Not good. Not good. And this is where we get to witness Jacob's strategic mind. This is Jacob's self-sufficiency kicks in. And he comes up with some, a plan for how he's going to protect himself and secure himself and his family and everything. So verse 7, in great fear and distress, Jacob divides the people who are with him into two different groups and the flocks and the herds and the camels and all of it into two different groups. And he separates them from each other, thinking if Esau comes and attacks one group, then the other group might be able to escape. Smart. Smart strategy. He's very smart, very self-sufficient here. And then he turns and resorts to prayer. But really, it's a, it's a complaining kind of prayer when you sit and look at it. And it's really the first, maybe second time he prays, and I want, let's pay attention as we look at it. It's in verse 9. It says, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac. But he doesn't say, my God. There's something still not there yet. God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I'll make you prosper. You told me to do this. He said, I'm, I'm an unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown me. I had only my staff when I crossed over the Jordan. When I ran away from home and came to this place, all I had was the the stick I leaned on to walk. But now I've got two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also my family and kill everyone. 
Because you said, God, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which can't be counted. And then he goes back to his planning. And again, he's got brilliant plans. I mean, if anybody could be self-sufficient, it's this guy. He is intelligent. So he spends the night there and then begins to choose a gift. He comes up with this idea, I'm going to send a gift to my brother Esau. And he sends to him a few hundred goats and male and females. So there's enough females and enough males to start his own goat herd. And he sends him 200 ewes and 20 rams, enough um, sheep to start his own sheep farm. Sends him 30 camels and their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys, enough to start his own ranching company. And he puts them in the care of his servants, each herd to itself. And then he says to his servants, I want you guys to go ahead and meet him while he's coming up to get to meet us. Keep, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to keep some space between each of the groups of animals so he separates them out. You've got the, the donkeys and you've got the, the goats and you've got the sheep and you've got the camels and all. And he separate them out. And he says to the first guy, here's what I want you to do. You go first, but leave like, you know, a big space between you and the next guy. Maybe a mile or so. And when you get to my brother Esau and he says, what is all this? I want you to tell him, your servant Jacob is coming behind us. And he thought, by doing this, it'll pacify him. And then he says to the second guy, when you get to my brother Esau, I want you to say, and he's like, what are all these animals? Say, your, your servant Jacob's coming behind us. He sends you this gift. So that there's like five or six waves of gifts that he sends. And with each one that Esau encounters, he's going to be told, here's a gift from your brother. So you can start your own ranching company it's essentially a, it's, it's the amount of tribute a town would have to pay to a king is how much he sends him. You see how the reversal's happening here, though, too, by the way? Jacob tried to steal everything from his brother, and now here he is giving a king's ransom to him. It's very interesting what's going on here in his life. And so he sends all that ahead, and then that night he gets up and he takes his family and everyone there with him, and he crosses the ford of the Jabbok River, and he sets them up over there, and then he goes back across the stream by himself, sends his possessions, everything he has, his family, all to one side, to the other side. And then he goes back across, and verse 24 says, so Jacob was left alone. When he had done all he could in his self-sufficiency, he was still afraid and alone. What are we to make of that? Self-sufficiency does not ever make you secure. It leaves you alone and afraid. When Jesus was teaching people to trust God instead of themselves, he told the parable that Kelly read for us, that parable about the, the rich man who had you know, plentiful crops and had a really great year. His business was going wonderfully. And so he said to himself, I know I don't have enough room, so I'm just going to tear down all my barns and build a new one to store everything I have. And then there's the part of that story that, that stuck out to me as I was reading it, when he says, I'm going to tell myself, to, I'm going to speak to my soul. Soul, you have enough laid up for many years, so relax. Eat, drink, be merry. And that's when God says to him, fool, this very night, Everything you've, you've acquired will be required of you. And who will get all these things you've prepared that you thought made you secure in your self-sufficiency? And that's the case for everyone who lays up treasure for themselves and is not rich toward God. And I thought, isn't it interesting that this wealthy man has to lay there in his bed and tell himself, it's okay, it's okay, you've got enough. You've got enough to last you the rest of your life. Your 401k is fat. You've got your Roth IRAs all put together and they're doing great. You move stuff around right at the right times so the market isn't killing you. You're doing okay. You got a nice home. Your mortgage is paid off. You're doing okay. Soul, calm down. Why is he having to tell his soul to calm down if things are so good? Because your self-sufficiency does not make you secure. It ends up leaving you alone and afraid. And not only does it hurt you, isolating you, not actually making you secure, it hurts communities, it hurts families, 
It hurts churches. It even hurts whole nations. I want you to hear part of a speech that President Abraham Lincoln gave 160 years ago in 1863 when he designated April 30th as the National Day of Humiliation, Fasting, and Prayer. This is what he said. He said, It is the duty of nations as well as of men who owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with a short hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. The awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Listen to this next part. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has grown, but we have forgotten God. Look, I'll never be shocked when a government or a nation forgets God. I'll never be shocked by that. And, and I want us to see past that. I know, boy, we think, wow, that's so true for us today, even more so, 160 years. But what's even more shocking is in those who have tasted the joy of the freedom that only Jesus can give when we cling to him, when we turn our backs on that, and return to this same useless self-sufficiency that had us feeling alone and afraid and insecure in the first place when it comes between us and God. That's the lesson Jacob's about to learn. God has shown him over and over again how God is the one who is taking care of him, and yet he keeps going back to his self-sufficiency. So he needs to learn that not only does your self-sufficiency leave you alone and afraid and insecure, your self-sufficiency keeps you out of God's blessing. Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. A lot of people have drawn the wrong conclusion from this passage, so I want to clear some things up about it. Um, when it says a man is talking about an, an angel from God. Jacob will later say, I saw God face to face because he had an encounter with God's presence there in the form of an angel that came up to him and began wrestling with him. But from this, some people have said, yeah, I've just got to go wrestle with God about this. As though wrestling with God is a good thing. And that's not true. <laughs> wrestling with God is not a good thing. The reason Jacob is wrestling with this angel, this representative of God here, is because Jacob isn't willing to let go of his self-sufficiency. So, number one, let's notice something. God initiates this confrontation, not Jacob. God shows up and confronts Jacob through this angel. There are two other times in the Bible when God says to somebody, hey, I want you to go there and do that. And then while they're on the way going there to do that, God stops them, almost kills them. Because there's something going on in their life there's a character issue that has to get dealt with before they can finish doing what God called them to do. Two other times. This is another example of that same thing. This is the third time in Scripture when God does this. If anybody's curious to know the other two, it's um, Moses and Balaam. But this is God stopping him because he's about to enter into the promised land. He's about to go into the place where God's blessing is and take up the mantle of carrying on God's blessing for this world. That's, he's about to step into that. But there is a character issue to be dealt with first. And it is his self-sufficiency. So this is not primarily a physical wrestling match. It can't be. Because in the end, when the angel decides, wow, I've had enough of this, he just, bink, touches his hip and it goes out of joint. Like, why didn't he pull that move in the beginning? 
Throw your best move out first, buddy. Why are you going all night like this? It wasn't a physical wrestling match. It was a spiritual encounter that was physically exhausting to Jacob and in the end finished with him being physically injured. It's true. But it's a spiritual wrestling and it's happening because Jacob insists on holding on to his self-sufficiency and God insists on wrestling that self-sufficiency out of him. That self-sufficiency that caused him to lie and to cheat and to manipulate. God insists, I'm going to wrestle this out of you and leave you instead learning to trust and obey me. Before you and I can enter into God's blessing, God has to wrestle out of us this self-sufficiency. For some of you, that right there is the barrier, the obstacle that's keeping you from taking that final step and really following Jesus. You're close. You hover up so close to following Jesus, but like, no, I can't, I can't just trust Jesus. I've, I've got to be self-sufficient. That's this last thing that you hold on to and won't let go of that keeps you from really actually entering into Jesus' promise and discovering the life he has for you. It's because you don't want to let go of it. And today, God's here to wrestle you. Not me. I could probably beat you too, some of you. But I can't do what God can do. I can't take that self-sufficiency away. I can't get it out of me. How would I get it out of you? God's got to do this. But then some of us might not even be aware of the self-sufficiency that's keeping us from God and from his blessing, that's keeping us from submitting to him. Some of us don't, don't necessarily see it. And that other passage that Craig read this morning was a moment when a rich man came up to Jesus, earnestly wanting to know, Jesus, what do I have to do to enter into your blessing, into God's blessing, this life? And Jesus, looking at this man, immediately recognized where his self-sufficiency had been placed. It had been placed in all of his wealth because he was a wealthy man. And so Jesus, because he recognized your self-sufficiency is in your wealth, he said to him, what you need to do is you need to sell everything you have, give it away to the poor, and then come follow me. And the man put his head down in sadness and walked away because he wasn't willing to let go of that self-sufficiency. He was a wealthy man, and he couldn't let go of the self-sufficiency he had put in that wealth. And then Jesus, it says in Luke 18, verse 24, again, let me just look, read it again with you. Seeing that he had become sad, Jesus said that famous line, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Not only does our self-sufficiency leave us insecure, alone, and afraid, it also becomes the obstacle that keeps you and me from entering into God's blessing. It robs us of life. Stephen Roderick wrote an article several years ago in 2019 called All American Despair. I just want to share you a little bit, a little bit about what he wrote. He said, in the last 20 years, we've seen a dramatic increase in suicides of white middle-aged men in western half of the United States, primarily in rural areas. The CDC recorded 1.4 million total attempts and four, over 47,000 actual successful suicides in 2017. White men accounted for 70% of all cases. The highest rates were in Montana, Alaska, Wyoming, New Mexico, Idaho, and Utah. Well, why? Why? They were the ones who most bought into a, a mindset. And this Dr. Craig Bryan, who studies military and rural suicide at the University of Utah, he traced this and he identified it and believes very strongly that it's a, this sense of independence and self-reliance that has become a major cause, and they traced it back in our culture. Do you know how today movies influence the way we think? TV shows, TikTok, it's, it's shaping. If you don't think it is, talk to young people in our world. 
if you don't think it's shaping you and how you view the world, if you don't think what you watch on TV or on Facebook or wherever you're watching, whatever you're watching, is influencing the way you see everything, wake up. It is. Well, we didn't have any of that stuff back in the day. What did we have? We had books. And so they trace this in American literature back to, in particular, this, this every man for himself mentality, this, this new way of, of looking where people are more and more saying, instead of we're in this together, they're saying, hey, don't tread on me, get away from me. You do your own thing, I'll take care of myself. They traced it to Ernest Hemingway's writings as one of the primary influences and promoters of this mentality. Hemingway wrote a lot of books where he romanticized war and hunting elephants and fishing in cold streams and drinking black coffee and smoking cigarettes around campfires. No writer, he said, is more responsible for the adoration of the terse, self-sufficient American man than Hemingway. Do you know what happened to Ernest Hemingway? Ernest Hemingway killed himself with a shotgun on a morning in July of 1961. Because he was, that year, he was 61 years old. And he found himself there in despair. He found himself in despair because he could no longer do the rough and tumble stuff he used to do. He couldn't go sleep outside around campfires the way he used to and be the man he had always been. He couldn't go hunt the way he'd always hunted. He couldn't be self-sufficient the way he'd been self-sufficient. And he decided life can't be worth living anymore if I can't be self-sufficient. And so he did what his father had done. His father had ended his life with a shotgun. And when that happened, Hemingway had said, that's probably how I'll go too. And sure enough, it's what happened. There were other factors involved. Alcoholism. He had had multiple concussions from plane crash landings and mishaps and things. But what really killed Hemingway was one of the things that's killing American men today. The fantasy of a man who needs no one but himself. Self-sufficiency makes you insecure and afraid and alone and keeps you from God's blessing. In other words, it does the opposite of what it promises you. It promises you, oh, you'll be secure because you don't have to trust anybody but you. So there's the only vulnerability is you're not, you're not vulnerable because of other people. Well, you're vulnerable because you're weak. We all are. It does the opposite of what it promises and so lying there on the ground with his hip joint ruined, Jacob couldn't wrestle anymore. All he could do was submit to God and cling to God, this angel, for his blessing. Clinging to God is how you prevail with God. Verse 26 says, then the angel said, let me go because the sun's coming up. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the angel said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said to him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And he blessed him. I love the way J.I. Packer, who's a brilliant theologian, man of God, describes what happened here. Listen, listen to what he writes and describes what happened there that night in Jacob's life. And I pray you and I don't have to wrestle the same way, but I pray we get to experience this too. He says, that night as Jacob stood alone by the river Jabbok, God met him. There were hours of desperate, agonizing conflict, spiritual and, it seemed to Jacob, physical also. Jacob had hold of God. He wanted a blessing and assurance of divine favor and protection in this crisis. But he could not get what he sought. Instead, he grew ever more conscious of his own state utterly helpless, and without God, utterly hopeless. He felt the full bitterness of his unscrupulous, cynical ways now coming home to roost. He had hitherto been self-reliant, believing himself to be more than a match for anything that might come. But now he felt his complete inability to handle things and knew with blinding, blazing certainty 
that never again dare he trust himself to look after himself and to carve out his destiny. Never again dare he try to live by his wits. The nature of Jacob's prevailing with God was simply that he held on to God while God weakened him and wrought in him the spirit of submission and self-distrust. It was that he had desired God's blessing so much that he clung to God through all this painful humbling till he came low enough for God to raise him up by speaking peace to him and assuring him that he need not fear about Esau anymore. Jacob didn't win by wrestling with God. He won by submitting. We know Jacob submitted to God because he accepts the name change from God. And that was an act of submission. That's what that is. It's an act that says, I belong to you now and surrender to you the right to name me, the power to name me. And the name God gave him, Israel, it meant, literally means, struggles with God, which is an interesting name. I wouldn't want that as my name. Struggles with God, I don't want that. But the name signifies more than the literal meaning. There, there's something that it's signifying here. It is signifying that God has taken Jacob's character as someone who wrestles and strives and he stripped away the self-sufficiency from that character that had corrupted it and it turned it into something bad and turned it into something evil and caused that, that striving to be something that harmed Jacob and the people around him. God has stripped all that out away as Jacob holds to him and really God's holding Jacob. From now on, Jacob will strive with God as God's not on his own. God is handing Jacob back his personality without the thing that made it sinful and corrupt. Do you get that? Does that make sense? Do you see that? When you come to God, yes, he is going to strip away things in your life. And that may be what's scaring you and keeping you from literally surrendering to God. But in the end, what God hands you back is you, a more true you than you've ever known before, a you with all the things that corrupted you stripped away. That's what God wants to do in us. That's what life is about, him stripping it away and making you new. Uh, C.S. Lewis captures this much better than I can. He, he wrote a book called Screwtape Letters. Some of you know that book. It's, it's a book where these two demons are having this dialogue and talking back and forth about how to corrupt um, people who, who God's trying to rescue. And in it, he pictures and depicts these and narrates a conversation between these two demons who are talking about what God does to humans. And, and they say this, well, when God talks of their losing their selves, he means only abandoning the clamor, the noise of self-will. Once they've done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts that when they are wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. The best thing you and I can do today is drop our self-sufficiency and cling to God. Cling to God as he humbles you, as he strips away the illusions of self-sufficiency. Cling to God as he points out all the places where you're your self-sufficiency is hiding and living inside of you, whether it's in your wealth or your intellect or in your looks or your youth or your accomplishments or wherever it's hiding in you, and it's squirmy, don't try to hang on to those things. Instead, cling to him and let him strip them away. Begin to see them the way Paul talked about seeing them. Paul began to see them like they were dirty rags. Start to see those things, that self-sufficiency in you, like it's a, a dirty rag, like it's a rag that was used to clean a porta potty at a construction site. Seriously, that's disgusting. So is our self sufficiency. It's disgusting. It's disgusting what it does to us, how it makes us alone and afraid and insecure and separates us from God's blessing and breaks our families, breaks our community, breaks our church, breaks our nation, breaks our world. It's disgusting. Let's learn to see it that way for what it is. And then when you and I surrender to God into this process, he strips away this sin. He begins to tear it away from us and it begins this process of making you and me more 
more you and more me than we've ever been before, truly who he created us to be. That's the process to submit to today. You might be wondering what happened next with Esau. The uh, Bible tells us that the sun was rising and Jacob limped across the stream to where his family was. And as he got to his family, he looked up and saw the dust kicking up and the hoof prints of the 400 men on their camels or horses, whatever they were riding, and Esau coming at them. And I'll tell you next week what happened. But for today, for today, all we need to know, all you need to know, all I need to know is this. You may feel like you've got an Esau with 400 men charging at you. You may feel that way. You may feel that way because of a sickness you're dealing with, a procedure that's coming up. You may feel that way because of a relationship that's mm, broken. You may feel that way because of an addiction or a bad habit. You may feel that way because of an actual enemy that's coming after you for some reason. There are all kinds of reasons. You may feel like you've got an Esau and 400 men and you're afraid and you're doing everything you can in your self-sufficiency to protect yourself from whatever might be happening. And it's not working. You're still afraid and alone and insecure. All of your self-sufficiency can't do anything to secure your life and your future. Only surrendering to Jesus can. Worship team, would you quickly come back? Only putting your life in his hands today. You don't got to worry about what's going to happen with Esau. You don't got to worry about what's going to happen with that thing. Put your life in his hands right now, today, surrender. Ask him, Lord, take this self-sufficiency from me. Would you all stand up? And let's give this time to God. Would you let him do something in you today? Would you let him talk to you today? He wants to show up and wrestle this out of you so that you can have life. Would you let him? Would you just submit? How long are you going to keep wrestling and fighting? There is no winning in the end. There's only losing. Holding on to your self-sufficiency is a loss. It's a death sentence. Letting go of it is the way into life.